third lecture in the current all-university faculty lecture series. The topic of the series for this year is the right to know. This evening's speaker is Dr. Edgar Friedenberg from the Davis campus of the University of California. Dr. Friedenberg received his PhD in education from the University of Chicago and has taught at the University of Chicago and Brooklyn College before joining the Department of Sociology at the Davis campus. He is the author of several works dealing with education and with youth, including The Vanishing Adolescent, Coming of Age in America, and the dignity of youth and other atavisms. He is a frequent contributor to Commentary Magazine, the New York Review, and other cultural enterprises. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Friedenberg. When I was asked to participate in this series on the right to know, the only assignment that was made to me was that I should speak on public education, what I wanted to say about it or what approach I wanted to make to a topic in this area was of course left up to me. I chose the title public school as a factor in perception because I wanted the title of the lecture, at least, to be neutral, since I knew quite well that I would not be when I finally got to the platform. And I wanted, therefore, at least to define the kind of issues that I would be talking about. But I plan to make this, as you will see, uh, decidedly a partisan uh, presentation. I selected this, this concept of the public school as a factor in perception because I wanted to deal not with what one learns in it, or certainly, rather, I should say, certainly not with what it proposes overtly to teach people, which varies to some extent, but with the consequences of school attendance on and the experience of being within uh, an American public school system of an ordinary sort for 12 years, the effect that this may be expected to have upon one's power or opportunity to know anything at all, or the way in which one would come to think of knowledge, uh, what one would conceive of, of knowing as meaning after 12 years of such an experience. I'm going to deal with the topic under two general rubrics with a few, some four to five specific points under each of the two. Before presenting those formally, uh, I think it might help if I use a matter for which I have used in presenting this lecture at certain of the other campuses. Generally speaking, uh, I'm going to be thinking of the public school as if its effect on the human mind were comparable to an effect that it might have on a camera. If I can borrow Christopher Isherwood's old uh, image of the individual as a camera from one of his earlier books, it seems to me that it is convenient to think of the function of the school or the functions of the school as divisible into two groups. Uh, there are those effects which are rather like taking the camera and hitting it so that the shutter is put somewhat out of order. It still works. I mean, it doesn't just play not work so that you get no exposure or an overexposure, but it doesn't work right and you can be reasonably certain that the exposures that you get thereafter uh, will not be of such precision that they can be used as conclusive evidence against the society. The other set of exposures 
experiences I would liken to an effect on either the scene or the photographic emulsion itself so that the nature of what is recorded, not merely the process of recording it, but the nature of what can be recorded, what there is to know, in itself becomes limited. The net effect then, in any case of these two processes, is to make reasonably likely, if not certain, that the experience of any individual in society will be somewhat less fully intelligible to him that certain of the experiences that might be otherwise available to him will be lost as a result of schooling that might nevertheless still be available to a naive observer. Some of the processes are crude, some are subtle, but the general effect, I would say, in any case, is to make, is to suit the person to be, so far as possible, a middle class, middle 20th century American, which is, after all, rather less to considerably less than being a human being. What could hardly be more, of course. The education, I think, makes you less. Learning, of course, can make you more but I think there is not very much of a relationship between the two. Now, the first of these sets of influences, those that I referred to as like taking the camera and hitting it and damaging it somewhat, I'm called the school as an influence on the concept of the self in society. The school as an influence on the concept of the self in society. In school, by and large, we learn. One, authority is derived from and limited by role rather than function. Authority is derived from and limited by role rather than function. That is, pupils learn that there are some things teachers cannot do to them that principals can, but they also learn that the school assumes authority over all aspects of their lives and not merely those demonstrably related to its specific professional function. Now this, I think, is one of the major influences of public education on the experience of growing up in America. The, if you want a complementary or contrasting example, that is, of authority derived from function rather than role and limited by function rather than role, I would say take the example of a physician whose authority over his patient is set by the fact that the physician is responsible for contributing to curing the patient's illness so far as possible. If a physician tells you that you can't take certain kinds of exercise or that you must, or that you may not eat certain foods, the rationale for this commandment is his understanding of certain metabolic processes with which you were involved. And the consequence of your disobedience is if you do disobey him, is not inflicted by him. If he is right, you will be in trouble if you don't do what he says. And if he is wrong, he is simply wrong. But you have no obligation uh, to do what he says because he is in charge of you. This is a free contract, in effect, uh, in which you are docile to the degree that you respect his professional competence. At the same time, if he were to come breezing through your house on the way to the sick room and say, that that's a pretty cheesy letter you got from your daughter last week. I mean, you shouldn't let her talk to you like that. Uh, or, uh, I don't, this, you must realize that the, the wallpaper in the bathroom is in, in, in rather poor taste. And if you expect uh, a medical attendance to be prompt and thorough, you, you can't really expect your physician to, to put up with anything of this sort. No, he'd feel demeaned himself uh, if he did, if he exceeded 
his own professional authority in this way. Schools notably do not, and school officials notably do not. I don't know how many, to take one rather common example, haircut cases we have had in schools throughout the country. The only ones that become prominent at all are those in which the parents uh, attempt to defend the child's right to wear his hair in any reasonable way that he chooses, or indeed in any way that he chooses. Now, it's quite clear that unless you have a hairstyle which is so long that it prevents you from hearing or seeing the materials presented as a part of the course of study, that there isn't any hairstyle which constitutes a clear and present danger to the educative process. And there is none, I would say, that can fall under a school principal's legitimate area of authority in the sense that a physician may legitimately tell a patient who has diabetes uh, to restrict his input of sweets. The prohibition is justified under the doctrine of in loco parentis, which has received some fairly severe blows, and I think well-merited blows, legally lately as applied to college students, less so with reference to younger students. But in any case, even the doctrine that the school stands in loco parentis seems rather difficult to justify uh, if in order to stand there the parent must be pushed aside uh, and his own uh, wishes for the child's uh, set aside and ignored. Well, in Connecticut, in the Edward Corey's case, of course, uh, the parents were faced with prosecution for contributing to their son's truancy. Not that they weren't sending him to school, but they wouldn't force him to get the haircut that the state required in order to end his suspension. Ultimately, they withdrew him and put him into a private school, uh, which presumably would not have ordinarily been a part of their budget. Mr. Corey is, is a carpenter, and while I have no particular sympathy for the economic plight of carpenters as compared to academics, still I think it would have been nice if they could have gone on using the school for which the ta their taxes had paid. A similar case uh, compromised in a rather similar way. Uh, in this case, I think the boy just went on back, occurred at in Houston, Texas, where the father, a professor of philosophy at Rice University, uh, attempted to uh, defend his son's right to wear his hair in his ordinary way. And then you had a case here in Los Angeles that I didn't know of until I was writing on this uh, general topic for Time Life books. And they dug up, if you've seen that, uh, that monograph, it's called The Young Americans, and I think is sold in most grocery stores along with other nutritious things. And they dug up out of their files a photograph from this area uh, of a boy, a, a Uruguayan youngster, who had been sent to jail for trespassing when he returned to school uh, after having been suspended. Well, there's been a whole rash of these, and I'm discussing them now not from the point of view of justice or injustice. They seem to me unjust, but that is beyond the specific topic that I'm dealing with. The point that I want to make about them is that these are educational experiences, and if unplanned, are nonetheless not, I think, unwelcome. And they are a part of the way in which you learn something about what de Tocqueville called the tyranny of the majority. And it does seem to me that they play a very central part in social integration of a society that operates as our society operates. In other words, what I'm saying is that people are compelled to go to school in part to learn that power in this society does indeed partake of this arbitrary nature and that it would be fruitless and unwise in most cases to attempt to exercise the freedoms that one might suppose to be 
among one's constitutional guarantees. And that one way in which constraint is experienced in America is in your learning when you were young that most authority is diffuse, that it will not limit itself according to its presumed terms of reference. That generally speaking, nobody who is put in charge of you for any purpose will of his own accord accept natural limits to that authority deriving from the purpose. Some may, but it is a comparatively rare experience. Those of you, if there are any, who saw the documentary on adolescence uh, in Webster Groves, Missouri on CBS last night, you have noticed that the parents were, for the most part, not reticent in insisting on their right to control their children's political behavior, if any, and beliefs, and that on the whole they did not resemble the late Thomas Jefferson in their own social philosophy. The second of these influences on the concept of the self in, the, in society, I've stated as in school, by and large, we learn that the self may retain no insight or conviction which is denied group validation. The self may retain no insight or conviction which is denied group validation. For example, though the setting refers to scholarship, one cannot go to a library and search out documentation for a position that conflicts with the text or the teacher's viewpoint. The school does not so much insist that the teacher and the group consensus achieved under his guidance are right, as that there is no legitimate appeal from their decision. Now here you see I'm making certain structural points, and also certain points as to acceptable practice within a secondary school. <coughs> a library which is well, start a little bit before that. You have, on the one hand, the idea that the school is a bookish place, that uh, homework is supposed to be getting more abundant and tougher, and you are supposed to learn to read and make use of resources and so on. Nevertheless, a high school library is so designed that even in a good one, it would be pretty well inconceivable that you could, in fact, experience scholarship as such. I'm not now talking primarily about the limitations of funds that mean that obviously you can't have files of technical periodicals and things going back and so on, the sort of thing you would need for university research. I'm talking first about availability. Do you recall, when you think back to your own high school days, I don't know if it was even like that now, but do you know that unlike a college student, a high school student can't go to a lot to the school library when he wants to learn something? His time is completely scheduled. He will have a library period, uh, ordinarily several times a week, not necessarily uh, every day and any library work has to be done during that time, but during that time, he must go to the library. There is no other place for him to go. Then the reference materials that are available are of a sort that you don't use anymore once you begin to do independent scholarship. It isn't, uh, isn't that they're elementary, it's that epistemologically they're wrong. I mean, You've probably read, certainly they exist in some abundance, criticisms of, so the Encyclopedia Britannica is probably the most pretentious and therefore perhaps the most extensively criticized of such works of reference. <coughs> the idea that there are general <coughs> compendia of knowledge to which one has recourse, in itself, you see, is almost a kind of intellectual hazing, at least it it sets up a picture of the nature of authority, scholarly authority, 
which is not so much too elementary as just plain wrong. In other words, the only way you can use this library is by assuming that a person who is doing research in a library is looking up the answers to questions that are known by people who have asked the questions and have told him when to answer them. And if you learn that, then, and get that thoroughly in your mind, then you're pretty well out of the running as long as, that, as you retain that idea. So far as the possibility of really independently questioning anything that may come up is concerned. You don't, not only don't know how to do it, you don't know that knowledge is organized in such a way that you can do it. Now, again, I think this does something more than create confusion. It suggests, you see, that the real test of an idea or a hypothesis is indeed group consensus. And it isn't that you learn that the group is right, but that it doesn't matter. Because there is no process of appeal that has as much authority as the consensus. And this becomes institutionalized and refined in some very significant commonplaces of American experience. I'm thinking, for example, through the course of the war in Vietnam, of President Johnson's preoccupation with polls and consulting polls. Now, of what value a poll can be on either a technical or a moral issue, much less on a complex one that includes elements of both, I don't know. Uh, I should say none whatever. Because you simply can't find out whether what we are doing in Vietnam is right or wrong by finding out how many people agree with it. And neither can you find out whether it will be effective by trying to find out how many people agree with it. All the same, it has become so completely a part of our way of life that I think really this is not the test, that the point is that we bring ourselves up or get brought up to believe that it doesn't matter how cruel or destructive or just plain stupid even and impractical a course of action may be, it will not really result in disaster unless it is generally disapproved. And this, I think, is something not only very dangerous, but very easily understood as a consequence of the texture and processes of schooling. I'm thinking specifically of the kind of material that Jules Henry describes in Culture Against Man, uh, or the, the kind of material that he includes, rather, the classroom situations uh, in which uh, the students hunt for flaws in one another's work and cue in to the answers that the teachers expect, uh, in which the conflict is not over getting at a reasonable explanation, but it's psyching the teacher out with the, the consequence that the, the learning situation becomes essentially one of learning to detect what is expected. And that is the prime question that is faced. And the third of these things that one learns in school by and large, I would say, is that rights cannot be defended because lower levels of authority are designed to fuse under heat or pressure. Rights cannot be defended because lower levels of authority are designed to fuse under heat or pressure. That is, the school principal will cancel the play that he has previously authorized, or the controversial speaker. In American society, one learns to assume that community agencies will respond to conflict by attempts to mediate. Only those persons who have issues that can be carried to the highest judicial levels and the resources to carry them there 
can expect to be sustained on a matter of principle. And even there, of course, one has notably in the judicial system no right to a writ of certiorari, that is, the Supreme Court uh, need not take any case. So there is no right to a court of ultimate appeal, even if one has the resources and know-how uh, to undertake one. Now, again, I hope I'm making it clear uh, that I am not just criticizing. I don't mind being a critic, and I frequently am, uh, and a very nasty one. But I'm trying on this occasion to do something else. What I'm saying is that these are things that we depend on to keep the society going. It's a terrible price. But partly, I suppose, this paragraph is really a paraphrase of Albert Camus's famous statement that there is no justice, there are only limits. And what I'm saying is that in American society, those limits are awful small, and that in school, this is one learning just how small they are, and not to really expect them to be much bigger is a part of the indoctrination. I don't know that they're smaller here than in most societies, and I can think of many in which the, smart, the limits would be narrower by far even than they are here, but we have one problem with respect to them that most such more confining societies do not, which I want to get to toward the end of my comment, but that I haven't come to yet. But again, what I'm saying is that I'm talking about a positive educational function, not a negative educational function. I don't mean positive good, but I mean positive. It's a real change. It's not an absence of change. Take, for example, the recent situation uh, at the University of North Carolina. Uh, you may recall that the state legislature last year in Raleigh, I believe this was rather fully reported in the Nation of the New Republic one, uh, attempted to, or came very close to passing a bill which would have denied the campuses of the university to communists or various other types of speakers whom the legislature regarded as unsavory. And the, I'm not, I think they're called regents, I'm not sure at any rate, the governing board of the university, which had been fighting this for years, albeit with increasing fatigue, once more managed to put the thing off, not on moral grounds, but on the grounds that this would be disruptive to the university and got the legislature to leave it to them. Well, last month, uh, Herbert Apthacker and Frank Wilkinson were two people who were invited to, uh, by a student group to appear at the university, and the trustees or regents or whatever they're called there refused to permit them. Uh, they were given, I think it would be fair to say, some guidance in their decision by the governor making public statements earlier to the effect uh, that he didn't see how the appearance of such men as these could serve any useful educational purpose. And the trustees agreed that this was so. I think it's manifest that the trustees were empirically wrong. Permitting Mr. Wilkinson and Mr. Apthecker there would indeed have served a useful educational purpose. And denying them the right to appear also serves a useful educational purpose. Either thing would have taught you something about American society. Whether what Mr. Apthecker or Mr. Wilkinson had to say would have been worth their coming such a long distance to say it is quite another question. But I don't see how it can be denied that st giving students the opportunity to see their trustees think out once more is educational. It confirms them, presumably, in their sense that the society is really the kind of place that they think it is. And an experience of courage would also I suppose, have been educational, although one so rarely gets an opportunity to observe one that it's difficult to say actually what its consequences would do.
In either case, though, you're teaching something. You're teaching an important insight about the relationship of school and society, about the respect vouchsafed intellectual activity as such, and the fact that this kind of suppression operates at lower levels is, I think, instructive in itself, particularly taken in conjunction with my first point, because it is a much more thoroughly oppressive experience to find yourself very largely under the control of a person who is not himself autonomous than it is to find yourself under the control of a person who, however tyrannical, does at least run his own show. And again, I'm not trying to be abstract. What I'm saying is, you learn something if you learn that your teacher can tell you how to have your hair cut and that you don't really have any civil rights to that will prevail against this or avail against it. But you learn even more through that if you learn later that the teacher who can make you have your hair cut any way he wants it has not himself the authority to sustain an invitation to the campus or can be brought up and badgered by a licensing committee for something that is written off campus or for that matter on it. So that you learn not only that you are subject to control, but that the people who control you are themselves among the weaker elements in the society. And that, I would think, would be likely to prevent you from making any excessive fuss about such liberties as you think might be accruing to you. And the fourth among these that students, and therefore people in general as they grow up, have very little right to privacy. The locker can be searched without process. This, of course, is right generally true for juveniles in California, can be stopped and searched without a warrant, uh, although an adult cannot. But it isn't only the physical search, it's the corridor passes, for example, that you have to get. Do you know that nobody can walk around in an ordinary public school without a written document uh, saying to the minute when they may move and when they may come back and what their destination is? There isn't generally a very wide range of choice among these. But this, again, I would suggest, does two things. It may possibly control movement, but after all, people do uh, manage to move of their own free will in public places, airports and other bus stations, where there's quite a wide range of social classes and differences in, uh, in behavior and manners without really getting into each other's way very much. I don't think that the main effect of this is so much to control movement, or the main function of it, as it is, again, to say, you may think you have a right to go to the bathroom when you feel like it, but one thing we must learn if we are to build a great society is that this is an administrative decision. <laughs> And after 12 years of it, it must be quite difficult for most people to have any real conviction any longer. I mean, any real gut, why of course conviction, that a passport is a document that establishes your citizenship in foreign lands and nothing more and must be given on request to a citizen who wishes to travel. It's a question then, you see, of rather systematically, though I think not conspiratorially, I don't mean that people sit and think these things through. Still, it isn't 
un it's not accidental either. I mean, efforts to liberalize the regulations, you don't, the response that you get isn't, uh, well, gee, yeah, I guess so. I mean, I never thought of it that way. It's genuine resistance. Uh, so uh, I would say that the, these are forms of functional indoctrination, although generally speaking not kinds that are thought through carefully and planned in advance. And finally, under this group of influences on the concept of the self in society, of what kind of person you are, as you learn about that in school. In school, by and large, we learn that society discourages intimacy. Now that, I think, is a very important, rather a crucial point that I will return to. In some ways, uh, this is obvious. I mean, you probably all know that most schools have regulations, high schools have regulations against uh, students holding hands in the corridor or even touching each other. I mean, you learn, kindergarten children learn that you don't do that. Uh, that any kind of body contact is incipiently either aggressive or sexual, and middle class people do not ordinarily engage in either form of behavior. This is, uh, is then discouraged. But there are less direct ways that may perhaps be more, more effective, that are more subtle. I'm thinking now of the kind of thing that my colleague in anthropology at Davis, uh, Yehudi Cohen, speaks of as boundary limits. Uh, the kinds of institutionalized forms that make it possible for people to live together uh, without driving each other into a psychosis. The incest taboo is the, uh, the main example of this, which he sees uh, as serving the function uh, of, uh, of permitting, well, can you imagine uh, what Brooklyn would be like if there were no incest taboo? I mean, with the, the close relationships that develop between mother and son, even as it is. But there are a number of less obvious uh, institutional forms that have the function, I think, of discouraging intimacy for purposes that I'll go into in a moment. The most uh, clearly functioning of these, although uh, I think we don't see it as that because most of us no longer believe that there is even any alternative to it, is the business of changing the teacher every year. That is the fact that you have a teacher for one grade in elementary school, then you go on uh, to an entirely different teacher the next year and so on. Uh, now, of course, there are lots of societies and sub-portions of societies that don't do anything like that. They may have no formal schooling, but even if they do, if you think back to what British upper-class education was characteristically like a century and a half ago, there would have been a resident tutor who was the same person uh, for some years. As long as he gave satisfaction, he often wasn't a very nice man. Uh, and he might even have been a brutal one, but the point was that whatever relationship developed, developed in depth, and the learning, instruction, and such, occurred within this relationship, which could be, of course, a destructive thing, but which certainly did not associate learning with a sort of over-renewed superficiality. Now, under our kind of system, quite the contrary is true. In the first place, most elementary school teachers, I think, rather like children. Certainly a larger proportion do than of high school teachers. And the children certainly, when they are small enough, uh, rather like teachers. In fact, quite dote on them. This is folkloric, it's the basis, obviously, of parts of Peanuts or of Miss Peach, of which I think perhaps the latter is the more profound social document. And you may even observe this with your own children. There's a teacher for a young elementary school child is a pretty important individual. Now, 
when she is replaced by someone else the next year, there are various ways in which the change could be handled culturally. A culture which was simply trying to provide specialized instruction, that is teachers who were particularly good with a particular age group, but not to discourage intimacy, would, I think it is reasonably clear, have some institutionalized provision for expressing the kid's feelings at the loss of the teacher. That is, you could grieve a little. But what we have is something rather different. That is, it's understood that the next teacher will be just as nice. She's trained to be just as nice because from the teacher's point of view, the niceness is, a, is technique and is a part of what her license is built on. So that what you really learn as you go up through these six or seven years is that the kind of security that you thought of as an interpersonal response isn't that and doesn't have to be that. It is that teachers are kind of like motels. That they, they may be quite striking in appearance or they may not, but the next one will really be just as good and an awful lot like uh, the last one that you left, that this is provided for and that it would be really a misapprehension, a form of futility uh, to go about, and as well as a little arrogant, to assume that the relationship that it meant something to you was a personal response to you. There are other ways, of course, in which this is discouraged in school, the kind of thing that David Reisman, uh, in one of his essays, has referred to in quoting uh, a school principal as saying rather triumphantly that their school, which was a very democratic and progressive one, discouraged cliques based on mere friendship. <laughs> but in point of fact, I think this kind of training is really quite essential for preparing people to function in an open society, which does indeed require, especially for those who aspire to executive levels of one sort or another, that the person not send down deep roots, but a lot of horizontal rootlets quickly, and that he feel reasonably at ease with new groups of people and not mind very much giving up old groups of people wh who, with whom his relationship has in any case been rather ambivalent since it's genu generally partly competitive uh, as rare, well as toned with feeling. So that this is again a form of training for maximum opportunity, equality of opportunity. Not that the maximum and equality are the same thing, but the equality of opportunity comes in, you see, in the same way. What's so terrible, after all, about a teacher playing favorites? A society in which people do play favorites is better than ours in some ways, as well as worse in others. But one of the ways in which it is worse is that it legitimates discrimination. And I don't see any way out of this absolute contradiction. I mean, uh, one would hope that the discrimination would be based on something more personal than race. But if you admit that people who differ in rank and power nonetheless have a right to strong personal feelings of their own, which may be reciprocated or dealt with uh, across whatever gap there is, then surely you have to admit that they are not morally obligated to treat everyone as equal claimants for some kind of even-handed reward. And unless one is prepared to accept this much personalization of personal relationships, then one cannot complain, as I do, about this aspect of education. In other words, what I'm saying that in pointing in my raising the objections implicit and explicit in the comments I've been making, there is indeed something ideologically illiberal, which I wish you would think about. One is so accustomed to hearing 
our society attacked with the conventional arguments of the left that it is, I think, easily overlooked that the same difficulties become perhaps even more striking if looked at from a position, say, of an 18th or 19th century conservative. And it's a point rather worth thinking about. Now, the second shorter group, and since some of the reasoning overlaps, I will not have nearly as much to say about them in any case. The second group of influences that I was speaking of, I've called the school as an influence on epistemology. That is the school, the experience of school attendance as an influence on what one comes to think of knowledge as being, what kinds of knowing are legitimate, what kinds of knowing are illegitimate. And at this point, I hope, the relationship of my lecture to the general series topic will become clear if it hasn't before, because there certainly is not any point in talking about the right to know unless you give some thought to what you mean by knowledge or by knowing the right to do what, the right to what kind of a process. This, you see, is really what I'm talking about, not censorship, not exclusion, not bias in the curriculum, not simply uh, the elimination of the Chinese from state history textbooks and so on, but the influence of education on the process of knowing itself and on one's concept of the texture of knowledge. Well. I have four things under this. First, in school you learn that the kind of material of which textbooks are composed is a form of knowledge. The kind of material of which textbooks are composed is a form of knowledge. I remember last week when I was serving as a consultant in a school district uh, near Sacramento, uh, being given a textbook on the French Revolution. I mean, it was a textbook, a history textbook. The topic that I was looking at was the French Revolution. It was being taught to some students who seemed quite bright and pert, but were presumed to be of low uh, reading ability. And the concluding sentence of this unit was something like, I don't think I can quote it verbatim quite this long, but I can come pretty close to it was something like, uh, although it had many defects and limitations, the French Revolution was a great event. <laughs> now, this is something you learn about it. And what made it so very, very sad was that this teacher, who was obviously a gifted teacher and a man who genuinely liked kids, and they liked, liked him, was God save the mark a Frenchman? How this happened, I don't know. And here he was uh, having to use this and what he had recourse to, you see, to try and make the thing a little vivid or meaningful, uh, was describing the court dress uh, of the people uh, who were put down in the course, the, the victims of the Jacobins, what kinds of clothes they wore, a few things of this sort. And there were some pictures in the textbook too. But it isn't only triviality, it's also what I call uh, the even-handed or yow-yow approach, which has replaced the avoidance of controversial issues. Instead of leaving things out, uh, you now say that Senator Joseph McCarthy was senator from the state of Wisconsin during the administration of former General Dwight D. Eisenhower, uh, and that he was an extremely conspicuous uh, and sensational figure, and that a great many people felt uh, that his use of the congressional investigative power had been overzealous and constituted a threat to liberty, but a great many others felt that although they disapproved uh, of his methods, uh, they could not but support his objectives. Uh, and then you explain that he isn't Senator Eugene McCarthy and go on to something else. <laughs> now, this is not really the kind of thing, that, this isn't a matter of quanta. It isn't just that these are small units of knowledge. This isn't knowledge at all. And if you think that your right to know consists in the right to know things like that, then 
it isn't worth a great deal to you. And I would submit that a great deal of what we call anti-intellectualism in American life, although it's there and it is indeed deplorable, really is perhaps not quite as, uh, well, doesn't represent such a, a devastating considered judgment uh, as one might suppose, because an awful lot of anti-intellectual people have no idea whatsoever of what the human mind can do. I mean, they've never had an opportunity to let it out on an open road, and they don't know what to put into it, or what kinds of equipment you can get to extend its range. And uh, I dare say they would not be so much in favor of, of automobiles, even, as they are if they had never seen anything other uh, than an elderly Volkswagen in a bad state of disrepair. It would, would hardly seem worth it. But people who did have this kind of experience of really knowing not only what you could do with your mind, but what was available in the form of organized records of the techniques of scholarship, and knew how far off the ground you can get with this in a short range, might, I think, be very, very difficult to integrate into a kind of public consensus of the sort that we've come to depend on. The second of these four, that truth is to be sought by a process of advocacy. All points of view are to be represented. Those that are to be excluded are first stigmatized as representing a party line and therefore not bona fide points of view. But the kind of truth that can only be elaborated through a single mind however well-disciplined and committed to evidence, is inherently suspect. Now, this is something that's pretty deeply rooted in our culture, the round table approach. And it takes off, I think, from a misapplication to epistemology or investigation of what is a valid political principle. Because it is indeed important, of course, that all points of view whether or not they are valid, and whether or not they are based on comparably serious considerations, should have a chance to make themselves heard in a political struggle. And so nobody has or should assume a right to dismiss another person's rival point of view uh, as trivial or as unavailing in a political context. But this is not the same thing as saying that the way to arrive at insight into a difficult process is by arguing about it and by making certain that anybody who feels strongly is either talked into being objective or neutralized by someone who also feels strongly on the other side. Neither, of course, is the process by which you get at complex truths one of dogmatism. It's much more, as I'm sure you well know, a matter of feeling your way through, following up hunches, testing the things that can be tested, sleeping on it, but it is always a pursuit from a single point of view. Can you imagine the elaboration of psychoanalytic theory by getting Freud and Adler and Jung and Adolf Meyer and an Austrian policeman and a hard-nosed doctor in a television station in Vienna to thrash it out? I don't think that would be a practical model. I can't think of any kind of scientific insight, which wasn't a great deal more like the arts than is generally supposed, that was not, that is, intuitive, in part deductive, in very large measure subjective, and then you devise hard tests afterward. But you don't cut this process off by insisting that this kind of knowledge is less valuable than that on which a consensus can immediately be achieved. And yet, generally speaking, this is the process of 
lower level education, elementary, not in the sense of elementary school, but secondary school and elementary courses. And results, I think, again in a kind of, of popularization that can only undercut the right to know by concealing again the nature of the process of knowing. And the third, that the pursuit of knowledge may be scheduled without gross impediment. Not merely the 43 minute classes or whatever they are, but the prerequisites, the, the counseling, the public nature of the decision to learn anything and the instrumental nature the nine-year-olds who are beginning to worry about getting into college, but particularly the absence of any form of spontaneity or any, any understanding that certain kinds of knowing require spontaneity, all of the more important kinds, I would say so that the fairly widespread complaint that you get from kids that their school attendance precludes their education rather than facilitates it particularly in the case of boys now that you can't even take off a year and try to to hope that this stuff will gunk down or something so that you can at least begin to make some sense out of it the scheduling i think is pretty a pretty devastating way of limiting the scope and depth of knowledge and then finally one learns that <coughs> the most reliable knowledge is extensive detailed and descriptive rather than intensive patterned and evocative which is again uh, I would say a way of, of making it clear that poetic knowledge is denied validation or status but denying the validation of such knowledge goes a great deal further than simply ruling out the humanities it also rules out any real understanding of the sciences or what they mean now on this point since it sounds uh, perhaps more than the others perhaps not uh, as something uh, which is wholly my own judgment and is rather abstract I do want to present a couple of paragraphs of empirical data of a rather interesting and I think curious kind considering their source I'm taking this from the published work of Charles MacArthur the reference which is a summary reference by him to a number of other papers uh, that he has published separately is an article called Subculture and Personality During the College Years from the Journal of Educational Sociology, volume 33, number 6, February 1960, if anyone wants to look it up. MacArthur is a psychologist trained at Harvard, I believe at present, a member of the student health staff there. He was for some years, and he started out he did his uh, doctoral work primarily on the uses of the Rorschach test and as I understand it uh, he first used a Harvard freshman as a sample when he was really more interested in the test than he was in them but they were a sample available to a graduate student and his first kind of analysis of his results as is not illegitimate in this kind of, of beginning work uh, was really pretty exploratory what he was looking for uh, was to find out what it was among all of the data that he had on his sample that seemed to be most crucial in producing contrasts as a psychologist of course he went through the usual hunches about broken homes and one thing and another I mean you know what what, what would come to mind what he found though was that he got sharper contrasts between his Rorschach protocols in dividing them according to one criterion that is assuming that he had to take one criterion either a mental health one or a social class one or something else but only one 
that the one thing that produced most, most contrast of all in a sample of Harvard freshmen of the middle 1950s was whether they had gone to a public high school before coming to Harvard or whether they had gone to what MacArthur called a St. Grottlesex school, which was his derisive term collectively for the more exclusive private schools, whether Groton or St. Paul's or so on. Now, I think from the term, and certainly from uh, what MacArthur found out, you can see where his own sympathies lay. He, uh, he is definitely a public school supporter, an open society man, a good Democrat. But he was also a pretty good psychologist, and this is a two-paragraph excerpt from his report of his findings. We have some evidence that with the same IQ being obtained by both men, that is simply controlling for IQ and making paired comparisons, the private school boy will have more intellectual range and power for his speed, while the public school boy will have more speed for his range and power. Our public school boys most often give an inkblot performance that is long on quantity and accuracy. They give a lot of responses, each one factually seen. Most private school boys give a performance that is long on quality. They don't give many responses, often as few as one to a blot. Perhaps the most flattering score that can be given an inkblot response is M and C, by which it is meant that in one complex image, the man being tested was able to use both the color of the blot and an imagined movement of the people he saw there. Now, I should interpolate that he's here assuming a good deal of knowledge about Rorschach's scoring. For one thing, he says the people he saw there, because he's talking about high-quality responses. Generally speaking, in other words, if the movement that, if the person who is saying what he sees in the blot sees a movement of people, that is considered to make a better human prognosis than if he sees it as a movement of animals. Or it's also bad if you see the people uh, as very much uh, smaller than the objects around them and by implication than the person who is seeing them. Or I suppose it's bad if you say they're only members of the Viet Cong and that you couldn't negotiate with them. But he's talking here about people who see other people moving around as fully human uh, in a Rorschach blot. And that this is particularly good if the whole blot and color, in the case of those blots that have color, if the, if the person produces a single synthesis, and what he says isn't this and this and this and this, but a coherent story about the whole thing. And this is generally accepted as a sign of a highly functioning, well-integrated intellect uh, by Rorschach analysts, of whether they're Beck or Klopfer or whatever they are. But this feat, MacArthur goes on to observe, begins to appear in the tests of people with IQs of 120 and becomes more and more frequent as we move up the scale into the upper ranges of intelligence. Ordinarily, the presence of even one such response is taken as proof of great creative intelligence. However, at any given IQ, the chances of getting one of these admirably complex responses is significantly better if the man attended private school. He has an exclamation point. Uh, however, uh, before we decide once and for all that private school thought is better, better is in quotes, uh, we'd best add uh, that the use of color and the responses of private school students is sometimes of the sort, scored CF, uh, that suggests impulsiveness that is not very maturely worked through. I don't believe we can say which style is better. They differ. Which I think represents a real triumph of the middle class style uh, in his own reasoning. Well, what this then finally leads up to, and my final comment, is that when you put it all together, I see these influences of public education on the right to know as a way, in essence, of countervailing against the libertarian tradition or the first ten amendments to the Constitution, if you will, in a mass society. <laughs>
That is, it seems to me that the school is doing two opposing things and that this opposition lies at the heart of the socialization process. It's on the one hand teaching the traditions of Jefferson or Madison or Adams. I've never been quite as certain of Washington myself. And as for Lincoln, I live in Davis. But as <laughs> but we did surely have an original vision uh, in this in the founding of this country of a kind of aristocratic sense of the human being, of human worth, which was apparently pretty practical up through up until Jackson's time, along with, of course, a commitment to increasing participation in the political processes and what was much more important uh, to an incipient process of industrialization that has had demographic effects that we're all quite familiar with. Well, I think then that what the school does is kind of comparable to what is done uh, in a cat experiment or one of those things in which you make people neurotic and is all the more effective for that. That is that on the one hand, the Bill of Rights, the traditions of dignity and democracy and so on are spoken of honorifically. They are described as good values. They're in effect the bait, the meat that the kid learns to reach out for and that would indeed, I think, sustain him. And then the processes that I've been speaking of, the electric shock that you get if you really take the promise of democracy and dignity seriously. And the result of all this is to ensure that the ideology does not become disruptive, that the very people who talk most about the Constitution will have enough anxiety as they think about it, that they're not really going to try and insist that it be applied to the conditions of their own life. And in this way, you're allowed, in a sense, to have your cake and eat it too. Of course, it's in a glass case, like the Constitution itself, and you couldn't any longer get to it to eat it. But you do not then run the risk of getting close enough to the essential values of American society to really get hooked on the contradictions. And the contradictions are probably inevitable in the practice of a mass industrial society. Now, all of this, it seems to me, was rather explicitly predicted by de Tocqueville in Democracy in America. And what I hope to have added that or what I have added that I hope is new, is certainly nothing in insight beyond what he would have given, but a specific connection between school practice and institutionalized educational procedures and the accommodation to a mass society, which has since become necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Friedenberg. There is time for some questions from the floor, if you, anyone has uh, points they'd like to raise. Yes. Well, to me, uh, the first and very specific thing that it seems to me one needs to do 
is to provide alternative ways of growing up. That is to say, uh, change the compulsory school attendance law so that it doesn't, so that it no longer puts kids in a total institution. I think actually we could get along quite well without it, and that indeed repealing it altogether would have comparatively little immediate effect in what people did, because the main reasons that people are in school, after all, is not to avoid being put in jail and truancy, or even uh, to cultivate their minds, but because in our society there really isn't much of any other place for young people to be. And simply repealing the law until you got other places for young people to be wouldn't make much difference. But if even though with this much freedom, if a student still had to go to school, but could go to any school that he chose, and could designate, say, a sum of the money that the state provides for his education uh, as a tuition payment to the school that he wished to attend, then at least you would no longer have a total institution to contend with. And some of the more egregious forms of constraint, I think, would be eliminated by sheer competition. Julius Roth, my colleague, is now at Boston University, but he's coming to Davis next year, who worked uh, with me on the first research monograph I ever did, a thing on self-perception in the university that was published by the University of Chicago Press in their supplementary educational monograph series 12 years ago, uh, has pointed out what seems to me to be incontestably true, though I never thought of it myself, that all total institutions, regardless of whether the pretexts on which they exist are punitive or therapeutic or indeed honorific, still end up treating people in about the same way. That is, whether you're in prison, in a school that you are not free to leave, in a mental hospital, or in the Marine Corps, there will be certain kinds of abuses. Occasional beating incidents, for example, seem to be almost ineradicable. Uh, certain kinds of humiliation at any rate, a reducing of you to a size that the staff can handle, that cannot be escaped or prevented. Inspection will not stop it. Uh, passing laws against it won't stop it for the simple reason that the inspectors come and go, but the victim remains in the hands of the same people after they have gone, and so do the witnesses. Now, Merely the introduction of the opportunity to vote with one's feet, then, I think, would improve matters a great deal. Now, I do think that at the present time, instituting any such provision uh, would, have to, would be dangerous unless it were accompanied by certain other safeguards that are easier to, to talk about than to put into effect. You would, for example, have to provide requirements that in order to be eligible to receive such tuition payments, a school could not be de facto segregated. Otherwise, you would have people using this, I think, simply uh, as a device for getting away from Negroes. And that is an awkward obstacle, but after all, uh, every fair employment, I mean, every contract with a provision under the Fair Employment Practices Act and so on, you still have the same policing problem. It isn't easy, but I mean, all, all you can do in any case, it seems to me, is to say you must not do this uh, and then supply enough enforcement muscle to try and see that you don't. As of now, of course, even uh, in public schools, uh, Mr. Gardner is under what I'm sure is well-deserved attack uh, for not having done what he can do under law. But that is, for my value structure, a drawback. I don't want it used for that purpose. Even so, it seems to me that one must worry in any institution first about the freedom of the people who are actually prisoners within it before you get on uh, to being concerned about the life chances of people who may be denied access to it. Uh, it's just the more, it's more of an emergency. <laughs> Now, as to positive things, how would you uh, 
provide education that did not have these characteristics or these limitations. I don't think there's any difficulty in thinking of ways, and I'll mention a few specifically in a moment, they're not generally mine, but that, after all, isn't the problem. Uh, the problem is that the processes that I've described, if my description is valid, are themselves the expression of social forces that will not cease to exist. And nobody is doing this as a result of a misunderstanding or a failure to think of anything better. It's that kind of a society. Well, but setting that aside, what would you do if you could do it? Well, I like a lot of Paul Goodman's ideas awfully well. I particularly like uh, this uh, business of using the whole community or parts of it as a classroom and going out with a te the kind of thing that is done under Operation Head Start a bit. Now, even that, of course, can... There are many teachers who can con who could convert an exploration of the entire city of Los Angeles into a system of cliches. I don't doubt that for a moment, just as there are many teachers who could make it a vivid experience. But uh, if they took the kids out to the music center uh, and uh, to... Uh, the new museums and so on, and that was it. I don't know that a great deal had been would be gained, especially if they were all uh, properly combed and so on. Uh, and I can just sort of see them maybe taking a few people down to see uh, the Rodia Towers in Watts uh, and explaining that Watts was such a lovely area because it had these lovely towers in it and so on and coming right back after having looked at the towers. I mean, there has to be a certain amount of good faith in not turning aside from the more revealing aspects of what you see. But certainly, to go out and interact directly with the material, with the, with the experience of life in the city itself is as valid uh, as it was when John Dewey suggested it. I'd want to see a lot of year furloughs in which you may be turned in a term paper at the end or something, or uh, a fourth grade thesis, but were allowed to set up your own experiences and do some of your own reading without having to tell anybody where you are for a bit. Maybe your parents if they really wanted to know. Yeah, but I'd, I would see me, I'd be bucking the great society itself. While I don't mind doing that, I don't expect it to fall down because I buck it. <laughs> yeah. some information about this, although I guess I've been brainwashed enough that I feel constrained to point out that this is only my own experience and not research, although I've published part of it. Of course, you're right. Uh, among the nine public schools, I mean, among the nine secondary schools that I studied in coming of age, have reported on in coming of age in America, and I was the only interviewer for this whole study. I, I went to all of the schools and talked to all of the 250-odd kids, around three hours apiece myself, and so on. We had one private boarding school included in the sample. And the kids there were all very much, well, no, I should, no true statement begins like that, but it was extremely common to find that the kids in this school believed that they would have more freedom in public school and largely for the reason you suggested, wouldn't be a boarding school, and people uh, couldn't uh, 
keep after them uh, as on as many things. They wouldn't have to be in necessarily by certain hours. Of course, in California and other places too, there are a lot of cities where you have curfews, so it doesn't make so much difference on that. Uh, but yeah, they were under more supervision. Nevertheless, this was the only school in which I found any kind of patterned revolt. These kids, some of them, were outraged by their lack of freedom. The public school kids, if they noticed it at all, were dispirited by it. And what I think made the difference was that within the curriculum itself, they did at least learn to look at larger pieces of situations so that they were more fully aware of what was happening to them. Whereas the public school kids tended to see the curriculum as a series of distractions. Of course, there's no reason why a private school cannot be run uh, of course, with a great deal more respect for kids than this one. Verde Valley, I understand, for example, to take one in the West, uh, really is, although it's always dangerous uh, to assume this. And I mean, when you get to the place, you usually find that somebody is carrying on a campaign against smoking even there, and even if it's only tobacco. But for the most part, it would seem as if uh, the place did deserve its reputation of treating kids with a good deal of respect. Putney in Vermont, I believe, is another one. There are some. Uh, now, a number of these get uh, mixed up, from my point of view, uh, and become overly addicted to austerity. I've never understood uh, why it is supposed to be better for adolescents to live poor and make their own beds and, and things of that sort. I mean, we have, after all, a fairly considerable British intellectual tradition. Uh, which was not, as far as I can tell, vitiated by the existence at Oxford and Cambridge of college servants. And I think that probably the same thing uh, in lesser degree was true of Eton, although it wasn't true of the preparatory schools before that, which were brutal and grim places. That is, to me, the important point is giving the kid some sense of his own dignity. And in a culture like ours, you no longer get that by having people wait on you, but neither do you necessarily have to go to the other extreme of assuming that you you have to make life hard for yourself. And I do think that this Roman Spartan tradition has been a weakness in in public school, uh, in, well, there in private school schools that might have carried on a tradition of somewhat more leisure. But I don't think that public schools, are, the trouble is I'm thinking of England and America at the same time, I don't think private schools in this country are nearly as monolithic uh, as public schools tend to be. And while the worst of them, for the reasons that you give, may be in our worse than any uh, ordinary public day school, even there they are likely to provide a basis, or to have provided, a basis for a somewhat more, not detached, but holistic approach to what is studied. However, finally on that point, I do think that this may be a consequence of something that is no longer true and that they're probably getting worse rapidly and more rapidly than I know. I think really the, the real payoff has been if you consider that MacArthur's data, as I said, were mid-50s data. And at that time, of course, Harvard was still, was not trying to vindicate itself by being more democratic to the degree that it now is. And probably the boys who were in a St. Grottle sex school could learn more because they could be less competitive. In other words, I suspect that to be among these high school students, you had to have such a high grade point average that you couldn't learn anything at all because you couldn't risk giving any wrong answers. And now, uh, I'm not sure it's much better in a private school with most of the Ivy Colleges bending over backwards to, 
to prove that they don't really give a break, say, to the sons of their own alumni and so on. So it probably what I'm comparing here is not really private versus public education, uh, but the advantage of a comparatively leisured class. Yes? I'm trying to understand you. Are you saying that in uh, primary schools and in secondary schools there should be no discipline or very little discipline? Is that, is that mm -hmm. my impression or am I wrong? Uh, is there a certain amount that, of discipline necessary? Uh, how much? That is not what I was trying to say because that is not the topic on which I was speaking, but it is one of the things that I believe. Uh, what I was trying to say, though, was something rather different, and that is that what passes as discipline is, in fact, in most public schools, uh, a form of humiliation, that is, and that this performs the specific social function of preventing people from making use of a democratic tradition which exists now, I think, primarily perhaps for decorative purposes. Uh, oh, there may be a necessity for discipline in any situation, as there was clearly a necessity for discipline in Watts, a necessity which is no tribute to Chief Parker. If you are a sufficient, if you're sufficiently incompetent at running any social enterprise, whether it is a city or a school, and sufficiently contemptuous of your clientele, you will indeed get into a situation where the most violent forms of discipline are all that will avail you any order, if indeed they will. But in what can be a common which what can only have meaning if it is a common undertaking, which education is or must be, then I would say that the necessity for punitive constraint, if it arises, though it may indeed arise, must be regarded as essentially, in most cases, an indication of the comparative incompetence of the authorities it was really, uh, it, was a, it was a question behind you, I was, yeah, excuse me. Uh, Dr. Friedberg, uh, suggestion which you made this evening for the improvement of schools is certainly admirable, but the uh, example which you've just used, uh, Verde Valley, well, Verde Valley happens to cost $3,000 a year in tuition alone. We have selected the most expensive private school in the nation today. Yeah. Now, my question is, what great pressure for us in American, in contemporary American society will force through a bill in any state legislature giving tuition grants to secondary school students? I don't know of any, and that's why in answering this lady's question, I said that after all, the thing that I, that although I could think of better ways of education, I saw no way of getting around the consideration that the present system uh, is, I think the usual vernacular, consistent with the power structure. Uh, I didn't know how much Verde Valley cost. I think at $3,000 a year, uh, that's pretty cheap, isn't it? I'm much more concerned uh, by the fact that if you were to spend $3,000 a year for every kid, you couldn't have a Verde Valley for him because there aren't, I mean, it would simply drive up the cost of such personnel uh, and such institutions for a while. They're, they're, they just don't make enough of them like that. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, the, the, the things that I'm talking about are faithful indices of the status of youth in this society. The expense, uh, $3,000 a year, how many adolescents are there in the country at the present time? Uh, it's a figure that I ought to have at my fingertips if I group people together that way. Me, I figured out once that this tremendous sum of money that they were supposed to get, something like uh, $10 billion a year or something, was uh, actually $11.50 a person. And maybe from that we can figure out how many there would be. Uh, but say it's uh, 20 million people of high school age, uh, 
that would be $60 billion less the cost of the present school arrangements, which are also considerable. It doesn't seem to me, uh, I mean, before you can turn Southeast Asia into a parking lot with liberty and justice for all, it seems to me this would probably be cheaper. Don't you think? <laughs> yeah. that would be true. Uh, I do think in, that in most cases, at least I don't know of any other way to win a fight except to fight it round by round. I do th feel that I uh, owe school people, and particularly f uh, in all justice to my own observation, uh, I don't mean to suggest that there is this much hostility. In fact, I would say uh, among them, and that it is always a pitched battle. In fact, one of the most depressing things that I know about public education is how good these people seem when they're not actually in the school. I mean, when you go uh, to meetings with them in the summer and so on, and it, it seems to me that really this thing is bigger than any of us uh, because it's quite clearly not the, not the consequence of either malevolent or stupid individuals. Most of the people I know who work in schools are perfectly capable of behaving competently, decently, and even creatively everywhere else. And I suppose it is a characteristic uh, of any social system. I mean, that's what we mean by calling it a system. But along with your advice, which I do not mean to set aside, I would also ask that we remember the message that Oscar Wilde saw hanging above the piano player's piano in Leadville during his visit to Colorado, and which delighted him so, which I'm sure you have heard of, but which said simply, please do not shoot the pianist. He is doing the best he can. And to some extent, I think... <laughs> And part and what you're bringing to it, then you're saying, if I understand you, is the authenticity of your own response and your own concern. Yeah, that's right. 
Yeah. Well, then I'm, I'm entirely in agreement. Yeah. I think you would have to feel a little empathy for these people when you go to find out that about 95% of their plan is legislated by the state government. And they don't have any idea about the law. Well, no. Uh, this isn't quite true because the legislation is not as confining as that. I'm sure it's meant to be. Uh, in a way you're right and in a way you're not to, uh, you're not right. There, that is to say, indeed, a very large proportion of the curriculum is specified in certain kinds of legislation. But the specification does not ordinarily extend to content. It indicates uh, certain topics. But uh, even if you do have to teach uh, 80 percent American history, and it isn't by any means that bad, obviously. Whatever it is, uh, American history, uh, well, there's a lot to be learned from it if you look in the right places. And the